tonight. Kota chaos. Bangladesh continues to see unrest over student protest as Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina places blame on the opposition for rousing conflict. Continuing crisis. Gaza sees no end to the conflict as Israel mounts yet more offensives with Benjamin Netanyahu setting off to Washington for discussions. Harris hustles. The Democratic camp gets to work sorting through the mess of Biden stepping down as backers rally around Vice President Harris to bolster support. And sending a message. One Nigerian creative sets his sight on bringing to the world a larger-than-life picture with hopes for a better tomorrow. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Avadarana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Warnasuriya. Good evening and thanks for tuning in this Tuesday night onto another edition of World News Tonight. Well, there's a lot to cover this evening and we begin with the ongoing situation that is unfolding in the neighbouring Bangladesh. Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina said a curfew imposed last week following days of clashes between protesters and security forces would be lifted when the situation is improved. Days of the student aid protest that turned deadly prompted the government to shut down internet services, impose a curfew and deploy the army. Well, a top court on Sunday agreed to scrap many of the proposed quotas after at least 147 people were confirmed dead in the violence. Here in Dhaka, military personnel patrol the streets with a shoot-on-sight order. They're maintaining a tight grip on the indefinite curfew that was imposed on residents just days ago after clashes between student protesters and security forces over government job quotas left 100 people dead. Students have been demanding an end to what they say is a discriminatory quota system that reserves a third of government jobs for relatives of those who fought in the country's 1971 War of Independence. On Sunday, Bangladesh's top courts ruled to scale back most of the quotas, saying now only 5% of roles can be retained for veterans' descendants. In the wake of the ruling, the student group at the helm suspended its protest Monday for 48 hours, demanding justice for those killed in the violence and the resignation of those involved, as well as a restoration of internet connectivity. Accused of using the quota to stack public jobs with loyalists from her party, the Prime Minister has defended her decisions, stating she only deployed the army when the protests were halted and that the curfew would only be lifted when the situation improved. In neighbouring India now, we are, there are contagion concerns. Health authorities in India's Kerala state have issued an alert after a 14-year-old boy died of the Nipah virus. According to the state's health minister, an additional 60 people have been identified as being in the high-risk category of having the disease. Kerala Health Minister Veena George said the boy was from the town of Pandikad and that those who came into contact with him have been isolated and tested. People in the area have been asked to take precautions such as wearing masks in public areas and refraining from visiting people in hospital. People who contract the virus sometimes show no noticeable symptoms while others show signs of acute respiratory problems. In severe cases, a Nipah infection can result in fetal encephalitis, a serious condition that affects the brain. The mortality rate among those who contract the virus is high as there is no medicine or vaccine available to treat the infection. Treatment is limited to managing symptoms and supportive care. The virus has been linked to dozens of deaths in Kerala state since it was first reported there in 2018. And the latest on the Israel-Palestine conflict now. At least 70 Palestinians have been killed and over 200 injured amid Israeli attacks on the Khan Yunis area in the southern Gaza earlier this week. This is according to the Hamas-controlled Gaza Health Ministry. The latest offensive began early today following an evacuation orders from the area which had previously been designated as a safe zone. This comes as Israel's Netanyahu headed to Washington for talks. Israeli shelling and airstrikes killed dozens of Palestinians near Khan Yunis, Gaza medics said on Monday, as many fled the damaged city. That's after Israel issued new evacuation orders to some neighbourhoods in southern Gaza, in what it said were renewed attacks in those areas. Medics said the Palestinians were killed by tank salvos in some towns just east of Khan Yunis, with the area also bombarded by air. The Gaza Health Ministry said the dead included several women and children, 
and that dozens of others had been injured by Israeli fire. The Hamas-run ministry does not distinguish between militants and civilians in its death tallies. Outside of Han Yunus's Nasser hospital, prayers were held for victims of the strikes. Medical staff there said that the situation at the medical facility, where a large number of casualties were being treated, was, quote, out of control. Palestinian officials said 400,000 people are living in the targeted areas, adding that those asked to evacuate were not given time to leave before the Israeli strikes began. Some families fled on donkey carts, others on foot carrying mattresses and other belongings. An Israeli military statement said the new evacuation orders were given due to renewed Palestinian militant attacks, including rockets launched from the targeted areas in eastern Han Yunis. The military added that to facilitate the evacuations, it was adjusting the boundaries of a humanitarian zone in Al Mawasi to keep civilians away from areas of combat with Hamas-led Palestinian militants. Israel vowed to eradicate Hamas after militants killed 1,200 people and took more than 250 hostages in an October 7th cross-border assault, Israeli tallies say. Gaza health authorities said the death toll among Palestinians in Israel's retaliatory offensive had exceeded 39,000 as of Monday. Ceasefire efforts remain at an impasse after nine months of war. On a related note, Palestinian factions signed the Beijing Declaration on Ending Schism and strengthening Palestinian solidarity after holding the reconciliation talks in the Chinese capital city from the July 21st to today. A closing ceremony for the reconciliation talks was held this morning. At the invitation of the Chinese side, representatives of 14 main Palestinian factions attended the reconciliation talks. This is the second round of reconciliation talks for the Palestinian factions in Beijing following the first round in April. The Chinese foreign ministry has said multiple times that China always firmly supports the just cause of the Palestinian people in restoring their legitimate national rights, supports Palestinian factions in realizing reconciliation through dialogue and consultation, and supports the achievement of Palestinian solidarity and unity, as well as the establishment of an independent state of Palestine at an early date. The ministry said China will continue to make unremitting effort to this end. Taiwan curtailed its annual Hong Kong war games today, including cancelling fighter jet exercises on the east coast as Typhoon Gaemi barreled towards the island and is expected to bring strong winds and torrential rain. Gaemi, the first typhoon of the season to affect Taiwan, is expected to make landfall on the northeast coast between Wednesday night and the early hours of Thursday, according to the island's Central Weather Administration. Currently categorized as a medium-strength typhoon by Taiwan, it is then likely to move across the Taiwan Strait and then hit the southern Chinese province of Fujian in the early hours of Friday. While typhoons can be highly destructive, Taiwan also relies on them to replenish reservoirs after the traditionally drier winter months, especially for the southern part of the island. Over in South Korea, torrential rainfall pounded the Seoul metropolitan area and Gangwangdo province overnight. The heavy downpours have led to road closures and residents are advised to check for traffic conditions before heading out. Heavy monsoon rain battered parts of the country overnight and Seoul is seeing some road closures. The heavy rain has caused the Hangang River level to rise to 6.21 meters. As of 9.37 Tuesday morning, Chamsugyo Bridge has been closed in both directions, restricting all vehicle access. And between 9.50 a.m. and 11 a.m., the Yoido Sangnyo Interchange area of Olympic Dero Expressway was closed to traffic in both directions before being reopened. And over in Incheon, where strong wind warnings had been issued, the fire department received some 58 calls related to damage from the heavy rain between 10 p.m. Monday night and 7 a.m. Tuesday morning. Parts of Incheon are seeing flooded roads and houses, as well as sea routes being suspended. Over in Cheron County in Kangwondo Province, firefighters were called to assist vehicles stuck in flooded roads. This, as the country at one point saw heavy rainfall of 74.2 millimeters per hour. One driver was stuck in their vehicle as it filled up with flood water, but firefighters were able to rescue them within 30 minutes of receiving the initial report. Meanwhile, the Korea Forest Service has issued the second highest landslide warning on a four-tier scale in Seoul, Gyeonggi-do province and the city of Incheon. 
Busan, Daegu, Gwangju, and Daejeon are all under the third highest landslide warning. The Forest Service called on residents in the affected areas to pay special attention to disaster warning messages and evacuate quickly in case of emergency. The government has called for the people to check the traffic situation before heading out and encouraged people to use public transportation. Well, let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Tonight on the road to the White House, Vice President Kamala Harris has secured the support of a majority of Democratic delegates to become the party's nominee for president. A survey the Associated Press late last night said she had received the endorsement of more than 1,976 delegates needed to win the nomination in the first round of voting. In her debut campaign speech on Monday, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris vowed to call on her experience as a courtroom prosecutor in dealing with Republican nominee Donald Trump. I took on perpetrators of all kinds. Predators who abused women. Fraudsters who ripped off consumers. Cheaters who broke the rules for their own gain. So hear me when I say, I know Donald Trump's type. Trump is due to be sentenced in September for falsifying business records to hide hush money payments to a porn star. He also faces criminal charges related to his efforts to overturn President Joe Biden's 2020 election victory. The speech to campaign workers in Delaware came just 28 hours after Biden stepped aside amid questions about his age and health and endorsed Harris. I love you, Joe. The former California Attorney General and U.S. Senator also said that building up the middle class would be at the center of her presidency. Together we fight to build a nation where every person has affordable health care, yes. where every worker is paid fairly, yes. and where every senior can retire with dignity. Yes. Yes. All of this is to say building up the middle class will be a defining goal of my presidency. Harris also highlighted other policy priorities, including gun control and reproductive rights. If Trump gets the chance, he will sign a national abortion ban to outlaw abortion in every single state, but we are not going to let that happen. The Trump campaign slammed Harris after the speech, calling her, quote, just as incompetent as Joe Biden and even more liberal. Harris went to work consolidating Democratic support for her presidential bid minutes after receiving Biden's backing on Sunday. According to multiple sources late on Monday, Harris has secured support from a majority of delegates to the Democratic National Convention. That likely ensures she will become the party's nominee for president next month. Harris's campaign also said it had raised $81 million in the 24 hours following Biden's exit, the most for a single day in the 2024 campaign for either party. Harris will travel on Tuesday to Milwaukee, the largest city in the battleground state of Wisconsin. The city last week hosted a Republican National Convention that offered a stark display of Trump's dominance over his party. Kimberly Sheetle, the director of the U.S. Secret Service, faced intense questioning at a congressional hearing about the agency's failure to stop the attempted assassination of former President Donald Trump. There were more calls for Cheetle to step down or to be fired. There were sufficient resources what did you just that say? were given to Did you just say there were sufficient resources? President Trump got shot. Day. In a contentious House Oversight Committee hearing Monday, U.S. Secret Service Director Kimberly Cheeto admitted that she and her agency failed when a would-be assassin wounded Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump at a campaign rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. I take full responsibility for any security lapse of our agency. But she signaled that she had no intention of resigning despite bipartisan calls to do so. Do you think you are the best person in the country to head the Secret Service? I think that I am the best person to lead the Secret Service at this time. Cheadle declined to answer specific questions about the day's security plan, saying the matter was being investigated, frustrating both Republicans and Democrats. 
I can tell you on our mission assurance uh, internal investigation, we are targeting to have that completed uh, within 60 days. So the notion of a report coming out in 60 days when the threat environment is so high in the United States, irrespective of party, is not acceptable. Have you provided all audio and video recordings in your possession to this committee as we asked on July 15th, yes or no? I would have to get back to you. That is a no. You're full of shit today. The shooting on July 13th wounded Trump in the ear, killed one rally attendee, and injured another. The suspected shooter, 20-year-old nursing home aide Thomas Crooks, was killed by law enforcement. It is still not clear what his motive was for the shooting. The Olympics are set to kick off at the end of this week and President Emmanuel Macron said that France was ready to host the Paris Olympics as he visited the athletes' village day before the Games begin. The opening ceremony on the river scene will signal the official start of the Paris Games on Friday. In the heart of Paris, the Olympic Games have taken over. On Friday, the opening ceremony will make history outside the confines of a stadium for the first time and on the water a floating celebration down the River Seine. Today, Team USA announced LeBron James will have the honor of holding the flag. So you get to wave the flag in Paris, my man. Fellow Olympian Steph Curry giving him the news. It was never a thought, it was never a dream, but um, it's, just, it's an absolute honor. For two weeks, athletes will compete across the city, many on the doorstep or actually inside some of the most recognizable landmarks in the world. No medal is ever guaranteed, but for the athletes who have finally made it here, one thing is certain. Guys, we didn't get this experience last Olympics, so we're no, like we overly hyped. Overly hyped. This is their chance. According to aid groups, civilians in Sudan suffered horrendous levels of violence during more than a year of conflict between the army and a paramilitary force, facing repeated attacks, abuse and exploitation by both sides. Sudanese civilians have suffered horrendous levels of violence, Médecins Sans Frontières said on Monday, during more than a year of war. They have, the medical aid group said, faced repeated attacks, abuse and exploitation by both sides. And the physical and mental wounds have been exacerbated, according to an MSF report, by the collapse of Sudan's healthcare system and a lack of international humanitarian response. Thousands of war wounded have been treated at facilities MSF supports, Hawkins said, including for gunshot, shrapnel and stab wounds. War erupted in April 2023 between the army and the paramilitary rapid support forces. It was triggered by a plan to integrate the army and the paramilitary forces as a part of a transition to free elections following the overthrow of long-ruling autocrat Omar al-Bashir in 2019. There is no accurate data on how many have been killed, but death toll estimates run into the tens of thousands. The MSF report accused the warring parties of a blatant disregard for human life and international law. Neither side could be immediately reached for comment. MSF called on the two sides to cease attacks on residential areas, allow safe passage and protect infrastructure from further destruction and looting. It also urged them to stop what it said were targeted forms of violence and abuse, including ethnic and sexual violence. Tesla boss Elon Musk says the electric car maker will start producing and using humanoid robots from next year. In a social media post, Mr. Musk said the robots will first be used by Tesla, which will start making them to sell in 2026. The technology billionaire had previously said he expected the robot, called Optimus, to be ready for use in Tesla factories by the end of this year. Other firms, including Honda and Boston Dynamics, have also been developing their own humanoid robots. The announcement came just a day before Tesla was due to release its latest financial results. The company has said it aims to build an autonomous humanoid robot to perform unsafe, repetitive or boring tasks. Mr. Musk has previously said Tesla aimed for the robots to be mass 
produced and cost less than 20,000 US dollars each. He is known for setting ambitious timelines for his companies, which he has not always met. We are going for a short commercial break. More will news right after this. Welcome back. A Nigerian artist, Fola David, is seeking the Guinness record for the largest drawing by an individual after spending six days on his piece in a stadium in the commercial capital Lagos. David, also a medical doctor, said his 1050 square meter unity in diversity artwork, an image of two giant hands holding Nigeria's map, was meant to showcase the country's rich cultural heritage. The project was a long-held dream for David, who first applied to attend the record in 2015, but could not embark on it. After applying multiple times and receiving approval from Guinness World Records, he finally brought his vision to life. Nigeria, Africa's most populous nation, has a vibrant arts and entertainment industry. However, the country's rich cultural tapestry has also been source of division as Nigeria is home to more than 250 ethnic groups, each with its own language and tradition. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Well, stay tuned as Anuradha Vikramasinghe will be joining you next in the Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching and have a good night.